This is your news source evening bulletin for today, Tuesday, the 5th day of October in the year 2021. I'm Gordon Mosley, and here's what we're tracking tonight. An investigative team from the Ministry of Health was dispatched early this morning to the Morocco community in Region 1 to begin the investigations into the death of 13-year-old Joshua Henry. The young boy collapsed and died yesterday, shortly after he was administered the second dose of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Just over three weeks ago, Guyana started to administer the U.S.-made Pfizer vaccine to children between the ages of 13 and 18 years old. The death of the young indigenous boy is the only fatality that is being investigated in connection to the vaccine locally. Minister of Health Dr. Frank Anthony today gave the assurance that the investigation will get to the bottom of the child's death. And of course, this is something that we want to um, investigate and to make sure that we understand what has caused the death. So this morning, uh, we have a team that is going to go to Maruka and they're going to do two things. One is that they are going to do a post-mortem on the body to understand the cause of death. And from that, we'll, we'll get a better understanding of what is the cause. The Minister of Health also expressed his sympathy to the family of the young boy. Dr. Anthony said while side effects from vaccines are normal, there is a rare allergic reaction which is possible, but it is very rare and could be very severe. But like with all vaccines, there are uh, two groups of reactions that you would see. Uh, the first set is called uh, side effects, and like with any medication, you can have side effects. These are usually mild or temporary. Um, so some people after a vaccine might get fever, some people might get a little bit pain, uh, some might get headache, fatigue. These are all side effects of vaccination, but after maybe a 24 to 36 hours, they go away. In very, very, very rare cases, uh, some people might experience what is called anaphylactic shock. Um, and that's like one person in maybe more than a million that can experience anaphylactic shock. We try to rule that out um, to make sure that uh, no person who we think might um, have the factors that can give them an anaphylactic shock that we will give them a vaccine. And that is why we have a very comprehensive checklist. And so when people come to get their vaccine, we go through that checklist with them. In its initial report on the boy's death late last night, the Ministry of Health reported that a child was administered the first dose of the vaccine three weeks ago. On Monday, he was administered a second dose, and there was no incident while he remained at the vaccination site for 20 minutes of observation. However, two hours after the boy returned home, he collapsed and was rushed to the Kamaka Hospital in the region, where doctors pronounced him dead on arrival. News source understands that just before the young boy collapsed at home, he complained of feeling unwell. The Ministry of Health's investigation will include interviews with the health official who administered the vaccine as well as with the boy's family. The post-mortem examination also forms part of the investigation into the death. While there were reports of other children suffering from various side effects after being administered the vaccine, there were no other fatalities. More news coming up in just a moment. It's been a long time coming. Overdue, some might say. But now that it's here, it will change life forever. And it is here to stay. The future is now. Transforming Guyana into the 21st century. Introducing GTT Fiber. Experience internet connectivity like never before. Speeds you deserve at prices you can afford from a name you can trust. Sign up today. GTT Fiber is here. GTT. Together, we rise faster. Strap in. You know that it, it is a fact The deal on wheels is bad For family Deal on wheels For security That's a fact For fun Deal on wheels Republic Bank Deal on wheels is back with same-day approval, reduced equity, longer repayment terms, and more. Plus, three lucky winners would win $100,000 each. Get the ride for you at Republic Bank. I am willing to get vaccinated so that I may be able to go back.
back to school, see my friends and play tennis again. I would like to take this opportunity to encourage parents with children between the ages of 12 and 17 to have them vaccinated as the benefits of vaccination outweighs the risk. These children will be able to attend school and this will help to prevent their learning loss and also enhance their social skills. Get vaccinated. All 12 ounce yellow cap Buster are now only $100. Buster, live in Come Coca -Cola. get your Buster, Buster $100. Dollar, come get your Buster, Buster $100. GBTI, make your dreams of owning a home a reality. Buy or build your home with us. Let us help you to completely outfit your home and make it move in ready. Need to purchase land? We finance that too. Benefit from our 10% down payment and interest rates as low as 4.25%. Calculated on the reducing balance with up to 30 years to repay. Switch your mortgage to us and learn about benefiting from the equity in your home. Invest wisely, apply online, or call your branch to schedule an appointment. GBTI. We see Guyana through your eyes. Welcome back. The man the police claim confessed to starting the fire that got to the Brigdam Police Station on Saturday is denying that he ever made any such confession. And he's accusing the police of forcing him to sign a statement after he was allegedly assaulted during questioning. The man, Clarence Green, who was in the Brigdam lockups when the fire engulfed the station on Saturday, met with attorneys Ronald Daniels and Kishana Jeffrey today and told them that he had nothing to do with the fire and was forced to sign a statement that was never read to him. The man told the attorneys that he was arrested early on Saturday morning on allegations of an armed robbery. He said he was searched before he was placed in cell 4 inside the lockups. There was nothing found on him during the search. Attorney Ronald Daniels said his client told him that he was the only one placed in the cell. And the moments after being placed there, he started to smell something burning and raised an alarm, which was ignored by the police. He said that within an hour of um, being put into that cell, he started smelling smoke. And he raised an alarm, calling out to the police, but nobody responded. So he alerted the other persons who were in proximity to him and cells next to him that he was smelling smoke and they too raised an alarm. None of the officers responded. Green also told his attorneys that he eventually fell asleep but was awakened by a prisoner at a door throwing water on him and alerting him that there was a fire. The man said by this time smoke was coming into the cell and the police started to evacuate them from the area. He said when they brought them downstairs, they checked all of the inmates again, including him. There were about 17 of them. Nothing was found on him. No implements capable of uh, starting a fire. And he said eventually the fire um, spread and started threatening the reception area. So they then migrated them to another building on the compound. When they got to that building, he was checked again along with the other inmates. Nothing again was found on him. Eventually, they were removed from that second building and taken over to the school. And I think it's granted that the school he referred to is the St. Stanislaus College. And he said he was checked there again along with the other inmates. Attorney Daniel said his client told him that while on their way to the police station on the east coast of Demerara, the prisoners were talking on the bus about the fire and the fact that their initial alarm about the fire was ignored. They, they, they were asking each other basically uh, how the fire started. And he said one of the inmates, uh, a young East Indian fellow, said that... Um, even before Mr. Green came to the station, he was smelling smoke and he attempted to alert the police, but nobody responded. And that was the guy in the cell next to him. And he said, oh, we knew the guy was in the cell next to him while he was running back and forth, um, throwing water in the cell. And the police 
let or open up the cell next to him, he saw the guy emerge from the cell next to him. The man said on Sunday he was taken to the CID headquarters where he was questioned while being hit on the shoulder. His attorney said his client told him that throughout the questioning at CID, he never confessed to starting any fire because he never did. He said he was eventually given a statement to sign and when he asked the officer to read the statement to him because he could not read, he was told that he should just sign it. The man said on Monday he was taken back to the scene of the fire where he again denied any role in starting the blaze. Um, They took a statement from him as well as the other um, the other inmates and he said he repeated in that statement what he told the first police officer when they took him there at Sparandam on the same day that he did not know anything as to how the fire started he smelled the smoke and he raised an alarm subsequently he was woken up in the cell by the other guy who came and threw water on him so he said he repeated that in the statement he gave to the police Attorney Ronald Daniels said his client was very clear about all that took place at the police station on Saturday. On Sunday, the police issued a statement indicating that the man had confessed to setting the station on fire by lighting a piece of mattress, tying it onto a piece of wire, and pushing it through the vent of the lockups into an office area. Immediately, questions were raised about the confession. More questions were raised yesterday when checks of the home address of the man provided by the police revealed that the address is non-existent and no one in the area knows the man. The attorney said the man actually lives in the Tamiri area but was staying at a relative in Charlestown when he was arrested. The attorney has since indicated that the complaint will be filed against the investigating officers who his client claims assaulted him during questioning. Two days after President Irfan Ali lambasted the response of the Ghana Fire Service to the fire which got to the Brigdam Police Station, the Ministry of Home Affairs has sent the fire chief, Kalamadine Idu, on leave with immediate effect. Mr. Idu, who was appointed fire chief in February, has not been told the length of time that he will remain on leave, but New Source understands that he is owed several weeks of vacation leave. The Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Home Affairs confirmed that Mr. Idu has been sent on leave, but she offered no other comment on the decision. President Irfan Ali did not hold back in words on Sunday as he accused the fire service of incompetence in its response to the fire at the Brigdam station, pointing out that persons who do not want to provide a public service should leave their jobs. The fire service in a statement about the fire explained that it responded to the blaze with a number of fire engines from the various fire stations in and around Georgetown. And let's turn now to the world of politics. Leader of the People's National Congress Reform, David Granger, used the observance of the party's 64th anniversary today to call out party members who he believes are dividing the party. Though Mr. Granger stayed clear of mentioning names, he reminded that the People's National Congress's founding leader, Forbes Burnham, warned of some of the occurrences currently unfolding in the party. To be sponsoring and joining factions in the party is to indulge in anti-party activity calculated to weaken the party. There may be different motivations, some springing from personal ambitions, others from a minority position firmly held. Whichever it may be, the objective result is undesirable and deleterious. Factions and factionism are wittingly or unwittingly instruments of our enemies. Mr. Granger, who remains on leave from the PNC, opted to pre-record his anniversary message rather than to appear in person at the Congress Place Ceremony to deliver the message. Since his party was booted from government last year as part of the coalition, Mr. Granger, who served as the president, has been heavily criticized by some members and groups of his own party for his management of the party since leaving office. He has been accused of running his own one-man show in the party and not involving the executive in many of the decisions that are made. The leader on leave has not yet indicated whether he intends to seek re-election as leader, but he said he does not believe in splitting the PNC. Our former leader was committed to reinforcing the solidarity of our party by knitting groups together, not splitting them apart, by building up, not breaking down, by multiplying, not dividing and subtracting membership, and to suppressing schisms, factionalism, and opportunism. Mr. Granger also hinted at the need for younger persons in the People's National Congress to take charge of the party's support base. 
The party is still pursuing the true path charted by our founder leader. The new cohort of parliamentarians has been elected to consolidate the party's massive popular support by intensifying the effort to realize the objectives of providing a good life for everyone during the coming decade of development. The People's National Congress is getting set to host its Congress and elections before the end of the year. A timeline has already been formulated for the Congress. Still with the PNC, the chairman of the party, Volder Lawrence, today made a call for unity to prevail within the People's National Congress as the party gears up for its 21st Biennial Delegates Congress later this year. She made the call while delivering her address at the party's 64th anniversary celebration this morning. Mrs. Lawrence said the actions of party members must set the foundation towards unification and not confrontation. We must expand the reach of the PNCR and allow our principles and commitment to the people of Guyana to dominate the political realm and improve the lives of all Guyanese. From this historical starting point, our personal commitment as well as our responsibility to all Guyana must include working to have a more organized and mobilized party united in its effort to advocate for its membership and all Guyanese. And focusing on the upcoming party congress, which will take place in a virtual setting, Mrs. Lawrence said the party's efforts to host the congress at this time must be recognized as a timely reminder of the dynamic nature of the People's National Congress reform. Our congress demonstrates our strength, our vivacity, and our dynamism. It demonstrates our unity and our vision. It shows the continuity of our work. Comrades, our Congress also holds a very important significance for our party. Let me therefore assure you, comrades, that no effort will be spared to ensure of your safety as all factors have been considered and all necessary precautions will be taken. Volder Lawrence is expected to be one of the persons seeking the position of party leader in the elections. She, however, said she cannot confirm her participation in the elections since that depends on being nominated. In the agriculture sector, sugar workers who were affected by the closure of sugar estates under the previous government will now each benefit from a $250,000 grant. This is in addition to the severance packages that many of them already received. The money is to be paid out to the workers before the end of January next year. Workers from the Enmore, Rose Hall and Skeldon estates are selected to benefit from the one-off payment. The announcement was made by Vice President Barrett Jagdio during a visit to the Burby's area on Monday. We have made it clear that those who are laid off, whether you are re-employed or not, I just said to the workers at Skelton that each of the 7,000 workers who were severed will get $250,000 each. Whether you got back a job or not, it doesn't matter. So today, the 7,000 workers, it will cost us about $1.8 billion. But we made a promise in the pre-election period and we intend to fulfill every single promise that we have made. And not only in this area, but every other area. The government has been reopening the closed estates and rehiring many of the workers who were laid off. Following the announcement by the Vice President, the Ghana Agricultural and General Workers Union, GAWU, said it welcomes the support being offered to the sugar workers. GAWU said the government must have taken account of the socio-economic tribulations that the workers have encountered following the closure of the estates. Although the government continues to pump billions of dollars into the problematic sugar industry with little to no returns, GAWU who has reiterated a decision to close their states has no sincere economic or social rationale. The union said it has now documented history of the decline in the standard of living that sugar workers faced at the hands of the previous government when they closed the estates. 
Well, in the aftermath of the recent fires that destroyed the Brigdam Police Station and the living quarters in the Vigilance Police Station compound, former chairman of the Police Service Commission and retired Assistant Police Commissioner Paul Slow wants the Ghana Police Force to develop a plan of action which will address future occurrences should they arise. In a statement, Mr. Slow said there should be a risk assessment of all police buildings, especially the wooden ones. He said the administrators of the police force should not operate as if it's business as usual, given the two recent events. He said firefighting equipment should be installed in all police buildings and there must be regular inspections of the firefighting equipment. He also said the frequency of the inspections must be made mandatory and fire drills must be developed for each location and regularly exercised by all ranks. Slow said the police force ought to also come up with a workable mitigation plan, noting that there was a comprehensive emergency response plan for serious incidents in Georgetown and its environs during his time in the force. According to the former senior police officer, senior officers of the force need to stop pampersetting around the place and focus on coming up with a plan. In an earlier post made just after the fire at Brickdam, Mr. Slow said that he was outraged that hours after the president committed to an international investigation to determine the cause of the fire, the scene of the fire was being cleared out. He said the police should not rely only on the confession that it said it got from a robbery suspect who was in the lockups and allegedly admitted to setting the building on fire. You think about looking fly, let me tell you where to stop by Breeders Hair Store, they got you, oh, Breeders Hair Store, they got you They got the expression braids, natural twists and water wave New locks, afro kinky, butterfly locks and so much more Come and get your braids right here now, we got any length you need Any color that makes you happy Breeders Hair Store, 236 South Road, Lacey Town, Georgetown Give us a call on 227-0554 Come and get your bread right here now. It's one of your biggest goals, getting your own home, where memories are made, where happiness lives. You may feel that home ownership or renovation is beyond your reach, but we at Republic want you to know that there's always a way. Ask us about our suite of mortgages. Let's help make your housing wishes come true or advise on how the equity in your existing home can finance other dreams and goals. Call or go online to learn more. We've got exciting news! All 12 ounce yellow cap Buster are now only $100. Buster, live in Come full get color. your Buster, Buster $100. We are legions of men standing strong, but never too proud to stoop and help someone. We must send a clear signal to all. Do right. Walk in upright ways, knowing that's what being a man is all about. And ever aware that things will only get worse when good men do nothing. Stand strong. Be the one to live right. It's been a long time coming. Overdue, some might say. But now that it's here, it will change life forever. And it is here to stay. The future is now. Transforming Guyana into the 21st century. Introducing GTT Fiber. Experience internet connectivity like never before. Speeds you deserve at prices you can afford from a name you can trust. Sign up today. GTT Fiber is here. GTT. Together, we rise faster. Super 95 Gasoline gives you more reasons to drive and is available at 56 service stations nationwide. For affordable price, high performance and high mileage, choose Guyol's Super 95 Gasoline.
across the region tonight. The Trinidad Express newspaper reports that the country's finance minister's $52 billion budget is laden with relief measures for the poor, small and medium businesses, manufacturers and tech companies, both startups and existing operators. But hidden in the pages of the 2022 fiscal package titled Resilience in the Face of a Global Pandemic were tax measures that may be actualized over the next fiscal year, such as property tax, the hiring of 100 accountants and university graduates for the Board of Inland Revenue to clamp down on tax avoidance as the Revenue Authority becomes the cornerstone of tax collection capabilities as well as the projection of increased utility rates. The budget has a substantial deficit of $9 billion Trinidad and Tobago dollars. Total revenue is projected to be $43.3 billion and total expenditure $52.4 billion. The budget is based on a 65 US dollar barrel oil price. Easement for the poor from November 1 will be the removal of vat from basic food items such as biscuits, cooking oil, canned vegetables, cornflakes, canned fish, canned meat, curry juice, sausages, ham, ketchup, bottled water, and even pigtail. The budget also offers relief to electricity and water bills in Trinidad and Tobago. The BBC reports that anti-vaccine residents in a village in rural Guatemala attacked nurses who were trying to administer COVID-19 vaccines, holding them for seven hours. About 500 people blocked a road and vandalized the team's car in Meguila, in the northern Alta Verbas province. The 11 workers were released after the police negotiated with the villagers who destroyed about 50 vaccine doses. Authorities say online disinformation is feeding resistance to the vaccines in Guatemala. The nurses were verbally and physically attacked by the residents, who let the air out of the workers' tires and destroyed the cool boxes storing the doses, the health ministry in Guatemala reported. Media reports also said the residents rejected the vaccine because a villager who received the dose had developed side effects, which were interpreted as being health problems linked to the vaccine. And finally tonight, international news. A former Facebook employee has told U.S. lawmakers that the company's sites and apps harm children, stoke division, and weaken democracy. 37-year-old Francis Hogan, a former product manager at Facebook turned whistleblower, heavily criticized the company at a hearing today on Capitol Hill. Facebook, however, said Ms. Hogan spoke about areas she has no knowledge of. It comes amid growing scrutiny of the social media giant and increasing calls for its regulation. Facebook is the world's most popular social media site. The company says it has 2.7 billion monthly active users. Hundreds of millions of people also use the company's other products, including WhatsApp and Instagram. But it has been criticized for everything from failing to protect users' privacy to not doing enough to halt the spread of disinformation. Both Republican and Democratic senators on Tuesday were united in the need for change at the company, a rare topic of agreement between the two political parties in the U.S. And that's your News Source Evening Bulletin for tonight. I'm Gordon Mosley, reporting and encouraging you to stay safe.